So what's the pipeline of Nigeria's budget for next year? That's what President Buhari spoke about today. He was at the floor of the National Assembly earlier this morning to present his final budget proposal to the lawmakers with a headline figure of 20 trillion naira. Back in 2016, President Buhari's first budget was mere 6 trillion naira, benchmarked on 38 oil price. But all that has changed. Discussing the budget proposals and the wider macroeconomy with me now is Muda Yusuf, the CEO at the Center for the Promotion of Private Enterprise. It's great to have you in the, on the program this evening. Thanks for making it through on the show. Let's get started. Uh, Buhari's exit budget, what can he deliver as a transition appropriation document? He says it's a budget of fiscal consolidation and transition. What's your first word? Well, uh, there is... Uh not much to talk about in the area of uh, fiscal consolidation because the fiscal outlook is not uh, is not particularly exciting of course it's, it's, it's a budget of transition i mean we're in a transition period and uh, he will implement the budget up until uh, may next year but generally uh, in terms of the fiscal outlook, uh, is something that uh, one should be concerned about uh, because, I mean, we are looking at a serious legacy of debt uh, that, that uh, the incoming administration will have to inherit. Now in the board proposal, uh, we are told that there will be new borrowings of $8.8 Already our Debt profile uh, is already around 43, that's 42.8 trillion. So by the time you add this 8.8 trillion to it, we are talking about uh, 50 trillion. And by the time you add the ways and means of the central bank, which is not often uh, talked about by the authorities, uh, the president didn't mention it, and even many times the, the Ministry of Finance hardly uh, make reference to it. But it is there, it is sovereign debt. And currently, it's close to 20 trillion. So, by the time you add all of that together, you are looking at a legacy debt of uh, almost uh, 70 trillion. So, that is a major issue for the incoming administration. Uh, it's a major challenge which has to be dealt with. Debt service to revenue ratio, even on the basis of what the president presented, is, is about 65%. But in reality, by the time we adjust for the fact that uh, the revenue uh, will not perform 100%, uh, I mean, you'll be talking about a debt service to revenue ratio of close to 80 or 90% at the end of the day. And we still have this abattress of a subsidy, which is hanging over, over the economy. Uh, how that will be dealt with, again, is still not clear. So it is, a, it is a major issue, it's a budget of transition. But as far as fiscal consolidation is concerned, I'm not sure that uh, we can appropriately uh, regard it, given the, 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 the track record of revenue performance. I mean, we have seen uh, what revenue performance is with uh, independent revenue that's from the government-owned enterprises. Mm. It has consistently underperformed. I mean, if you're able to achieve 50% of that, we can't ourselves look. And the economy is also not in such a fantastic shape as to be very optimistic that from other taxes, I'll be able to get a lot more revenue. So the revenue projection for me is a bit on the optimistic side. And given the fact that some key reforms that needs to take place have not taken place. So this is, is a major issue. Uh, this is a major challenge for the incoming administration. I'm, I'm getting somewhere here. Uh, Muda Yusuf, thank you so much for raising the question. This, the, the budgeting for economic growth and development, uh, Nigerians will be asking, where was last year's budget? Where was the one before that and the one before that and the one before that? So, uh, what are the key issues for Nigeria here? Uh, have we been able to use the annual budget to actually spur economic growth and development? Have we been able to do so? Well, we have been able to do so to some extent, but to the extent that we have serious capacity limitations as far as funding is concerned, the budget has not been able to deliver much. And when you look at the budget that's government spending to GDP ratio, 
ours is one of the lowest, even by African standards. I mean, many, I mean, in Nigeria, for instance, it's just about between 11 to 12 percent. We look at South Africa, it's close to 20 percent. And many other, many other countries on the, on the continent. In some cases, it's even as high as 25, 30 percent. So that shows you the impact, even if you assume that all the, all the expenditures uh, go through 100 percent. It's still not going to be significant. It's even much worse because most of the projections are not met, especially on, on the revenue side. So the, the budget has not had that much impact. Of course, the, the president ruled out quite a number of achievements, uh, which, of course, we cannot dispute. I mean, the roads, uh, the railway system, the airports, and also and so on. But the challenge is that the deficit in terms of infrastructure and some other facilities in the economy is still extremely huge. You know, so that for me is a major issue. And I think one way out of this is to look beyond the budget. Because one thing that is becoming increasingly clear is that we should rely less and less on the budget for some key things that need to happen in this economy. Key things like infrastructure, for instance. There was a time we had this proposal on the road bill, road fund bill, and some other. You know, there is a limit to which we can continue to depend on this annual budget to fund infrastructure. We need to devise some other creative ways of, of funding infrastructure. You know, otherwise the, the, the budget cannot cope. And the president also alluded to the fact that even for tertiary education, it's becoming increasingly clear from all the crises we have had with ASU and all of that, that government, even at the best of times, it is extremely difficult for government to adequately and fully fund tertiary education. So we should begin to look at, think outside the box and rely less and less on mainstream budgets for some of these critical development projects. Okay. And policy also matters. Yes, policy please, matters please, please, because please go, please go it's ahead. not enough yeah it's not enough just appropriation yes whatever you have you can appropriate but the policy environment is sometimes even much more important because it is it's through the policy environment that you can mobilize a lot of capital into the economy private sector capital and that can go a long way and it can give you multiples of what even the budget can deliver but you need the right kind of policy environment, the right kind of regulatory environment to be able to mobilize these resources. This is what is happening in other parts of the world that are making progress. No. You have to create that environment so that you have a lot more private capital, both from within and from outside, outside the country. That's, that's on the, you're speaking on the macro side. Uh, uh, Mr. Yusuf, let's talk about budgeting for poverty reduction and inclusion, what needs to change? Have we been able to use budget to reduce our poverty, to lift people out of, uh, of, uh, of poverty? Do you think we're moving the needle or we're just moving around in circles as in the manner of speaking? Well, the biggest factor in poverty is actually inflation. Because effective inflation for the poor in the last one year, it will be close to 50%. So if there is anything that has had a major devastating impact on the poor people, it is inflation. Budget, I mean, the emphasis on budget is mainly on appropriation. But again, if we have a structure of budget that is loaded heavily with deficits, with borrowings and all of that, it has implications for some of these macroeconomic Variables. If the deficit financing is climbing higher, if CDN is throwing in more money to support to support the, the federal government in terms of ways and means, these things have implications for the poor through the channel of inflation. And if you talk to any poor man today, it's not so much about, but it's about inflation. So we need to manage the environment, the macroeconomic environment properly to ensure that we don't have a situation 
where the meager incomes of the poor people of the average Nigerian will be so massively eroded. The purchasing power, that is the crux of the matter. Of course, we have other factors that are affecting poverty, like insecurity. You know what percentage of our population depend on agriculture? And look at what insecurity had done to this segment of our population. It has, it has escalated the level of poverty. Many of them are not excited about these handouts from social investment. They want to go back to their farms and make a living on their own. So insecurity, to the extent that the budget can address that, yeah. that way it also be addressing the issue of poverty. Yeah, we were talking about budget that, at the federal level, uh, so we're talking about it. But what about how impactful are uh, annual budgets at state government levels, states that are the closest to the people? Is it the same thing as a federal level? Have we seen impacts across state budgets, as it were? Well, uh, I wouldn't say we are seeing much of the impact. Because uh, in many of the states, the level of accountability, the level of citizens' engagement is not, is not very deep. At least occasionally, at the federal level, you have some serious engagement between the National Assembly and members of the executive. But you hardly see that at the state level. And when there is no demand for accountability, it is difficult to get the right kind of outcomes. So that is a major weakness, you know, at the at the, the sub-national levels. It's even worse at the local government level. The level of accountability, the level of citizens' engagement, the level of checks and balances, they are very weak. And once you have that kind of weakness in engagement and demand for accountability, then you are not likely to get the right kind of outcomes, you know. So uh, the states are, of course, the, the, the closer to the, to the people. Some of them are doing very well. Some of them are not so and doing not so well. But again, it, demand, it depends on how accountable the states are. OK, so uh, to sum it up, uh, give me one minute of what you think the biggest headwinds for next year's federal budget for Nigeria will be as President Buhari's administration makes its exit and a new one comes on board. Well, the biggest headwinds, of course, we have the subsidy problem, the big elephant in the room. We don't know how the next administration will deal with that. It's a major, it's a major headwind to fiscal sustainability and to the capacity of government to deliver uh, the, the dividends of democracy to citizens. And of course, we have issues around the oil theft. Some progress is being made, but again, it's something that is a major headwind because of its impact on revenue and foreign exchange earnings. Then we have the foreign exchange policy. The foreign exchange policy is creating a whole lot of problems for investors in the economy. It's a major headwind that I hope the next administration will have the, will have the courage to, to, to do, I mean, to fix it, because the distortions that it has created and the impediment that it has created for the inflow of capital into the economy is enormous. So we need to remove those barriers. And of course, we have insecurity. It's a major issue. And the rule of law. Look at what just happened to, to Dangote Cement in Obatana. It's a complete disregard of rule of law for such a massive investment. And yet you have the endorsement of the states for that kind of behavior. It, it, it doesn't speak well of, of, of the kind of investment environment that you like to see. If there's any challenge, we have the court, we have processes. But if state authorities are now encouraging this kind of invasion of a major investment facility is something that should give all of us a cause for concern. It's a very bad precedent. It gives a very terrible signal. So th these, are, these are some of the things that we need to worry about as we step in into 2023. All right. Uh, thank you so much for this conversation, sir. We appreciate your insights on this subject. Muda Yusuf, the CEO at the thank Center you, for the Promotion of Private Enterprise and a former Director General of the Lagos Chamber of Commerce and Industry. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Mm -hmm.